Now joining us to talk about AI in the military and defense is uh, Michelle Gaida, CEO of the Kroc uh, Institute uh, for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University. She's a former assistant secretary of state uh, for global public affairs in the first uh, Trump administration. And um, I wish I hadn't had to, to, uh, to read all your notes on this because it's just very concerning, uh, Michelle, at this point. I, I mean, it could be. I guess it's like anything. It's a tool that could be used for immense good, but it, it could also, in, in the, with China or Russia or other places, it could, it could be really serious if we don't monitor it. That's right. I think we're seeing artificial intelligence and, and a number of emerging technologies reshape not only the battlefield, as we're seeing in the case of Iran, but uh, the domains of power stretch far beyond the battlefield. The battlefield's also information. It's also financial. It's also commercial. So from a kinetic perspective, we're seeing it take place. We know our warfighters are using artificial intelligence to ingest a lot of information, make decisions a lot faster. Israel has been using it to prioritize targets in Gaza. Ukraine has been using it for some time in the fight against Russia. But, you know, just look at the information space. Iran has been using generative AI to develop fake content and propaganda within its closed media environment to suppress dissent, to shape narratives there. That's information warfare. And you can go down the authoritarian list, as you said. You know, if you look from a financial perspective, the PRC has strategically been deploying capital into our markets, into our U.S. and allied tech companies to uh, have access to our IP, to our emerging technologies, to have undue influence in our markets. That's financial warfare. Commercially, you know, you'll recall a few years ago, Russia ransomware shut down JBS. It was the largest food supply, uh, meat supplier in the United States. That's commercial warfare. So warfare is taking place on the battlefield in different ways, thanks to artificial intelligence, but it also extends to all of these other domains. And technology is a cross-cutting thing. So for the United States, the big imperative is we just have to be better at the tech. Can you describe some of the battlefield uses? I was uh, in, in looking into to some of the, uh, the methods that are employed. It was fascinating, but also uh, a, a little bit scary. Uh, I think, for example, they, it can save human lives, but if you save human lives, then leaders are, are probably less inclined to try to avoid conflict if they know they're not going to use any lives, which could end up starting something where even more lives are eventually lost. It, it's, it, you know, there's so many dots that connect with AI. Well, AI is helping our warfighters connect those dots and to have tools like artificial intelligence take what is really an overwhelming amount of data on the battlefield across a number of domains, ingest that and, and help to develop insights that can inform decisions is a really strategic tool. So it's helping accelerate decision making and smarter decision making in many ways. Um, but in terms of how it's reshaping things, you know, one of the really interesting things to recognize is that uh, our technological edge in AI in many cases started from a commercial standpoint. These things weren't in, in the first case built for war. And NVIDIA is a really good example. What's powering the AI revolution and the tools that are reshaping the battlefield? It's NVIDIA's chips. 30 years ago, they started out as a, uh, a company wanting to do 3D graphics for gaming and for multimedia. Meta is another really good example. Started out as Facebook, and we just saw in the news a, a few days ago they're going to be partnering with Anderol on augmented reality and virtual reality for combat technology. Uh, AWS was a, an internal tool for Amazon where we're doing our online shopping. Now they're helping with cloud infrastructure for DoD. And so in many cases, these things started out as commercial first. They're being applied now to the battlefield in really interesting ways. But that's a really interesting call to action for a lot of business leaders, innovators, and builders who aren't necessarily in quote-unquote defense tech, but everybody has a role to play in ensuring our technological advantage and in many cases our advantage on the battlefield. I want to talk just quickly about, it's fascinating that, that Israel reportedly used AI to, uh, with its drone program inside Iran to, to find leaders and, and, and high-value targets. How would that, how would you use a, AI for that? Do you, could, can you just help me? Yeah, so there, it, it helps with sensors and identifying um, a lot of graphics and satellite imagery. You know, before it used to take a long time to, to comb through as a human a, a lot of these images to make sense of them. Some of them are high quality, some of them are really low quality. And so AI can help discern uh, and start to make decisions from these types of uh, technologies. And, you know, you bring up a really interesting point with Israel. And if you look at how the United States and Israel has collaborated 
Um, if you look at the deals that the United States recently announced in the Middle East following President Trump's trip to the region with uh, Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, with Qatar, all of these shaped around artificial intelligence and defense, it's the reason why these types of partnerships and alliances are so important, because not only do we have to be really good at the tech, so do our allies. And so if we're all uh, consolidating around American-led tech or allied tech, uh, we'll have a force multiplier advantage.